From the world of politics to the world of business, this is Balance of Power. Live from Washington, D.C. From Bloomberg's Washington, D.C. studios to our TV and radio audiences worldwide, welcome to Balance of Power. Alongside Joe Matthew, I'm Kaylee Lines. Joe Biden vows to continue his reelection campaign, brushing off calls to quit after a disappointing debate performance against Donald Trump last night. Plus, key rulings from the Supreme Court curbing federal regulators' authority and siding with a January 6th defendant. The justice is expected to deliver their opinion on Trump's immunity on Monday. We'll have more this hour with Jim Kessler of Third Way, Andre Gillespie of Emory University, and our political panel with a lot to talk about on this Friday. Kaylee, we started with news from the Supreme Court and rolled into the return to the campaign trail for both Joe Biden and Donald Trump after an historic night. I think we can all agree. Uh, indeed, a night in which both sides of the aisle seem to believe that Joe Biden performed more poorly yeah. than Donald Trump. And yet Joe Biden went on to Raleigh, North Carolina today while Donald Trump was campaigning in Chesapeake, Virginia. And each of them gave their message to voters on the heels of last night. Hello, Virginia. Did anybody... Last night, watch a thing called a debate. Ah, that was a big one. But as you saw on television last night, we had a big victory against a man that really is looking to destroy our country. I don't walk as easy as I used to. I don't speak as smoothly as I used to. I don't deb debate as well as I used to. But I know what I do know. I know how to tell the truth. from wrong. <laughs> and I know how to do this job. Joining us now for more is Bloomberg's Mario Parker. So, Mario, obviously you heard a more forceful Joe Biden in North Carolina than was on the stage in Atlanta last night. And for all of the talk in the immediate after aftermath about Democratic panic, this idea that perhaps someone else would need to be the nominee, it does now seem that many Democrats are lining up to show their support for Joe Biden, including former President Bill Clinton, who just posted... On X, facts and history matter. Joe Biden has given us three years of solid leadership. We heard something similar as well from former President Obama earlier today. Yeah, what you're saying is they're circling the wagons, essentially, right? So for the Biden campaign, they're casting this as uh, a benefit for them, uh, somewhat of a win, not a win in the debate, but a win that they have a, still have the, the confidence of the party's leadership. But make no mistake about it. The first two lines of Barack Obama's statement was it was a bad debate, mm -hmm. right? There's this realization. That the, that, that the president performed, I mean, really poorly. The, his comments in North Carolina started out with an anecdote from First Lady Jill Biden saying that he proposed to her five times, a, a way to kind of signal his tenacity. <laughs> Some of his concluding comments talked about him knowing how to get up from the mat. Mm -hmm. So that, excuse me, acknowledges a, a knockout in some ways. Mm -hmm. A knockout, that's pretty tough. The analysis is tough, even as uh, you're pointing out from uh, allies of the president. What makes the campaign, though, think this would be any different in September when they meet again? Why should Americans think it would be any different four years from now if he's reelected? And that's a great question, because as much as he's getting the support publicly mm -hmm. from some of the party's luminaries, there's still no signs yet that that's done enough to essentially quell some of the anxiety, right? We were at a five-alarm fire from what we saw last night, speaking with sources, both last night and then this morning as well. Whether or not Barack Obama or Bill Clinton come out with public support versus what Americans and Democrats in particular saw with their own eyes last night, what some of the exit polling showed, where his numbers, the, the, the numbers in which they trust him to run the country from Democrats, mm -hmm. dropped from about the mid 50s to the mid-30s, right, overnight. Um, whether or not that's been enough to shore up the base is another story. So how long do they, and by they I really mean President Biden and those close to him, have to realistically change their minds? Is it right up until the convention in August where they could reevaluate whether they should continue with this re-election campaign, or is that actually a decision, if it is to be made, that would come much sooner than that? 
Well, a couple of things, right? So we're in the fourth quarter. There's no doubt about that right <laughs> yeah. now, right? Uh, leading up to the convention will probably be, that's what's been posited in the public sphere is the most likely situation. Mm -hmm. Even still, based off of our reporting, uh, just speaking with experts as well, it would be a tough thing to pull off at this point. I mean, Biden won the primaries. He has the delegates. Who do you pass the torch to? What are some of the systemic things that you do? Some of the ballots are starting to be printed it right now, right? We're on the cusp of early voting. So whether or not you can kind of turn this airplane around that quickly, that's not an easy feat. Mario, thank you for the insights. Bloomberg's Mario Parker this day after the debate. And for more on how the outcome of last night's debate could impact congressional races, we're certainly hearing a bit from Capitol Hill. We turn now to Bloomberg's Megan Scully, who leads our congressional coverage. Uh, after the debate, we heard from Claire McCaskill, among others. This was instant analysis uh, as she talked about Joe Biden's performance. He had one thing to accomplish, she said, that was to reassure America that he was up to the job at his age, and he failed at that tonight. Are we going to see a split here among Democrats? Because to Mario's point, some are trying to circle the wagons here. How about the rest? We're not seeing it quite yet, but we certainly are seeing some hesitation on the part of Democrats on Capitol Hill. Today, James Clyburn, the 83-year-old um, mm. dean of the South Carolina delegation, who who's credited with Oba with getting Biden the presidency with yes, that indeed. win um, in, in 2020 in South Carolina, actually ran from the press. He didn't want to talk about it. He did later come back and talk to reporters. But what, were, what we were hearing on the Hill today was a very tepid response. They were going after Trump rather than certainly not congratulating Biden on, on the night. And, and you did see some in difficult districts and states acknowledging head on that it was a horrible night in the words of Angie Craig, uh, a Democrat who is is up for uh, in a tough reelection battle for her seat. Yeah. Well, so it does raise the question of, of what the tail effect is here. If Joe Biden is seen as a weaker uh, Democratic nominee, if that influences the way that voters may be looking down the ballot in especially some of these more contentious districts, is messaging from congressional campaigns going to have to change around that potentially the idea that Donald Trump is likely to win, so vote for us and keep us in check so we can provide that check in Congress? I think that it is particularly um, difficult for the Senate candidates in these statewide races where you're talking about mobilizing the vote in cities like, like Philadelphia or Phoenix um, and, and getting out the vote for the person at the top of the ticket, Biden, and having, you know, Sherrod Brown or Bob Casey and other Democrats who are in these really tough fights statewide, you know, sort of carry along in the president's coattails. Mm -hmm. Enthusiasm in these urban areas is already really low for the president, and that is already worrisome, to, particularly to the statewide candidates. Mm -hmm. After last night, enthusiasm certainly is not going up in those areas and, and may we'll see if it can recover. But um, where we are right now, if I were a senator, particularly running in some of these swing states, I'd be very concerned. Yeah, it's worth keeping in mind that this is not just an election in regard to the executive branch, but the legislative one as well. Bloomberg's Megan Scully, thank you so much. Now, elsewhere in the judicial branch, two major rulings from the Supreme Court today. In one, the justice is rolling back a decades-old legal doctrine that could rein in the powers of federal agencies. And in the other, the court backing a January 6th defendant and a decision that could affect hundreds of prosecutions, including potentially that of Donald Trump himself. For more, let's bring in Bloomberg's Greg Storr, our all-star Supreme Court reporter who has been very busy indeed uh, today. Greg, if we could just begin, as this is Bloomberg, with the overturning of the Chevron Doctrine. This is law that goes back to 1984. It could have wide-ranging implications. I guess the question is, does, does, do things change now for the regulators, or are some decisions that regulators have already made likely have to change as the result of this ruling? Well, really, both of those. Uh, it could change things that happened in the past, things that are happening now, and things that happen in the future. Uh, this doctrine, known as the Chevron Doctrine, is really kind of the legal foundation for much of what goes on in this, uh, this city. Uh, it has said that if there's an ambiguous statute, uh, 
the agency basically gets first crack at figuring out what that means and how much authority it has, and courts will defer to that interpretation if it's reasonable. Now the Supreme Court has said no. Courts are the ones who have the, the, the main role. We're not going to defer to agencies anymore. And that has upended not only uh, you know, years of, of legal decisions and uh, work of agencies, um, but also will limit what agencies can do going forward, especially in those kind of fast-moving fields where Congress hasn't actually enacted a statute that makes clear what the agency can do. We also got a ruling uh, on January 6th, at least a uh, January 6th defendant, a riot defendant, uh, who is asking the court to reconsider essentially this idea of obstruction being used uh, in Enron era law that had to do with paperwork, shredding documents instead of blocking an official proceeding like certifying an election. This is going to make it more difficult for prosecutors to use this obstruction charge, not only against uh, January 6th rioters, Greg, but Donald Trump himself. And on Monday, we're going to get a very important ruling on presidential immunity. With the time that we have, tell us how this is going to play out Monday morning when we get back to work. Yeah, so first of all, just on the January 6th ruling, remains to be seen how much mm -hmm. effect that has on Donald Trump, whether that applies. On Monday, we're going to find out whether uh, Donald Trump's bid for, for immunity from prosecution for his efforts to overturn the election results, whether that, that argument essentially delays his trial. Uh, the Supreme mm -hmm. Court has been considering whether uh, prosecutors have to limit what they're charging to uh, pro things he did in his private capacity as opposed to his official capacity. It sure seemed like from the arguments that the Supreme Court was going to say presidents have some immunity for their official acts and we're going to kick the case back to a lower court to sort out which is private, which is official, and that is very likely going to mean that no trial is going to happen before the election. All right, well, we'll find out for sure on Monday morning, which is July, by the way. This is an mm -hmm. extraordinary Supreme Court term indeed. Bloomberg's Greg Store, thank you so much. Now coming up, we'll take a look at the impact of last night's debate on the Democratic Party itself. Jim Kessler, co-founder and executive vice president of policy at Third Way, weighs in next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. making sure that we continue to strengthen our health care system, making sure that we're able to make every single solitary person eligible for what I've been able to do with the, uh, with, with the COVID, excuse me, with um, dealing with everything we have to do with, uh, look, if we finally beat Medicare, That was President Biden during last night's debate, where in the middle of an answer, he paused and then misstated his own policy. That just one moment in a very difficult 90-minute face-off with Donald Trump that has led to some calls for Biden to step back from the Democratic nomination. Though today, he says he's staying in the race. Joining us now for more here on Bloomberg TV and radio is Jim Kessler, co-founder and executive vice president of policy at Third Way. Jim, welcome back to Bloomberg. Always great to have you. Last night was rough. I think we all know that. When we came up for air this morning, there was a lot of conversation about whether or not Joe Biden was going to be able to stay in this for the long haul. Do you believe him when he says he will be up against Trump in November? Well, you know, one of the things you opened this segment 10 minutes ago with his rally in North Carolina, and he, one of the things he said, and he was very strong today, he said, I know how to do this job. And that's unequivocally true. He's had a great three and a half years. That takes real skill. That doesn't happen by accident. But by any objective measure, as good as his first three and a half years was, the debate last night, he was awful. And, um, you know, that's, I, look, I, I think it's, it goes in a long string of presidents who in their, you know, incumbents in their first debate doing badly, it goes back 50 years to Gerald Ford in 1976, and every one of them has done badly. But this was the worst of all of them. And what he did today in North Carolina, I think, helps. But he needs to do more. I mean, he needs to do more to convince voters that he is the Democrat, the Joe Biden, who can do this 
job, which he's done for three and a half years. So he has work to do. Well, bring us inside the war room here for a minute, Jim, because everybody woke up this morning to a conversation about Gavin Newsom and Governor Whitmer of Michigan and any other Democrat who might be able to jump in this thing and win a contested convention. What's the reality of the situation? Joe Biden is the presumptive nominee. Will he leave Chicago as the nominee? Is the rest of this a waste of time? My expectation is that he will, but let's go forward to, to right now. Um, he had a debate. It was bad. It raised the questions that he's been needing to battle for the last 12 months. Mm -hmm. So what he needs to do is he needs to go on a seven to 10 day run where he is out there and active and trying to change the image of last night's debate into something more that resembles what he did today in North Carolina. And that means every single day doing something, going on the Sunday talk shows, doing unscripted events, doing interviews, you know, live interviews with news media, uh, doing unscripted town halls, you, you know, with questions. Mm -hmm. That's what he needs to do to, um, to quell those concerns. And if those concerns aren't quelled, Jim, if he doesn't do that effectively, considering one of his primary messages and what he was able to articulate last night was that he feels Donald Trump poses a threat to American democracy. Is Joe Biden potentially putting that on the line if he stays in this race? Well, one of the things that shocked people, and it certainly shocked me, is like, I did not expect to see the performance that I saw last night. You know, I've seen him on many occasions. He's generally very, very strong. You know, there's always been, he's always had gaps. There's always been places where he runs on. So he needs to go out and, uh, you know, he needs to convince folks that he's the Joe Biden that was so effective for these three and a half years. And what I would add is there are people, and you played a, you talked about what Claire McCaskill said last night. Don't yeah. dismiss those concerns as just the bedwetters. You have to go out there and show, and win back the confidence of those voters. I believe he can do it. But that's his task for the next seven to 10 days. Then we come to the, you know, the Summer Olympics and the Republican convention. Like, he needs to move now, uh, you, you know, to, to replace that image of the debate with something more current and better. Well, you're kind to answer our questions and do some soul searching with us here as a Democrat, Jim. But shouldn't the party also be pointing to the other guy on the stage? Donald Trump told in excess of 30 lies last night. Not one of them challenged by the moderators on CNN. Yeah, so I'm I'm not going to blame the moderators for that. Okay, um, you know that's should the Joe job. Biden I'm, have done better live fact checking Donald Trump? I don't think you have to do live fact checking. Okay, but I, you know, in this the format of this debate, the way they agreed to it, it, it wasn't really a situation where the moderators that was their responsibility. That that is the way this debate was designed. And I don't think it was Joe Biden's job to um, fact check Donald Trump. But he can point out, I mean, the lies are so obvious, they don't need a fact check. And look, I think your underlying point was, the only reason why Donald Trump had a good night last night was because Joe Biden had a bad night last night. Because Donald Trump was close to awful as well. I mean, especially the last 60 minutes, it was unhinged and delusional and filled with so many lies that you could open a Pinocchio factory and still need to build another plant in China to take care of all the construction you'd need. So he only did well because Joe Biden did poorly. So yes, Donald Trump is vulnerable too, but Joe Biden has some work mm -hmm. to do. Jim Kessler, it's great to have you. Thanks for joining Executive Vice President at Third Way. Back with us today on Bloomberg. Coming up, more reaction to the debate. We'll have more next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio.
Welcome back to Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Democrats are playing the spin game on this Friday after last night's presidential debate between Donald Trump and President Biden, with many choosing to attack Trump rather than defend Biden's performance. We spoke with one Democrat, Congresswoman Haley Stevens of Michigan, who told us this earlier. He's the only one who has beaten Donald Trump and has debated him before and beaten him by 7 million votes last time. And, and look, I'm not going to try and sugarcoat last night. It wasn't the best performance. Uh, it, it was shaky. Uh, I would have loved to hear the president talk more forcefully about his record. He's the one defending a, a woman's right to choose. He's the one standing up for abortion access. I have seen him talk about these things very forcefully. He also got an infrastructure bill done. But what crystallized last night is that people, voters, have had concerns uh, about his age and about his fitness, and that now has call, called that back into question. I personally, as a lawmaker who have done, I've done big policy alongside this president, I'm continuing to put my faith in him. Uh, he is in that big role to make decisions. And he has made a whole host of decisions uh, very well, very effectively, and I'm going to continue to entrust him to do that and to speak clearly and honestly with the American people, as he has done many times before. So this is something you see making its way through the convention, and Joe Biden is going to be the nominee, obviously, in your eyes, because a lot of people last night were talking about your governor. Governor Whitmer. Did you talk to the governor after the debate to get her impressions on how things went? I talked to her a lot. I yeah. have not talked to her since the debate. I think she's fantastic. Mm -hmm. She has done a great job. This whole idea of drafting her in a contested <laughs> convention, though, is that is that crazy talk? Well, look, George Packer talks about creative thinking to save democracy and many Americans know that's what's on the line here. Mm -hmm. I mean, we have a former twice impeached convicted felon president uh, who, again, couldn't denounce January 6th, uh, wouldn't say that he would embrace the results of a free and fair election, doubled down on abortion bans, saying that the overturning of Roe was a, was a great thing. And I know that Gretchen Whitmer is a fantastic surrogate for Joe Biden, and she has been standing alongside this administration and alongside him coming out of last night. I'm excited for her future. Again, that's her decision to make down the road on, in terms of what's going to happen and what's going to unfold over the these next series of months. There's an amazing ground operation in Michigan and uh, around this Biden campaign. Mm. Dozens of field offices, sleeves rolled up, campaign staff working hard, recruiting people for weekend events. Yes, last night was a, a tough night. I've worked on tough elections before, tough presidential elections. So mm. we're just going to have to roll up our sleeves and continue to see this through. Michigan's Haley Stevens with us on Balance of Power. This is Bloomberg TV and Radio. The fact is that his big kill on the black people is the millions of people that he's allowed to come in through the border. They're taking black jobs now, and it could be 18, it could be 19, and even 20 million people. They're taking black jobs, and they're taking Hispanic jobs, and you haven't seen it yet, but you're going to see something that's going to be the worst in our history. There were no jobs. We provided thousands of millions of jobs for individuals who are involved communities, including minority communities. We made sure that they have health insurance. Donald Trump, President Biden, last night's debate, of course, trying to discuss the progress they made for black Americans during their tenures. Joining us now is Andre Gillespie, political science professor at Emory University, who is, of course, watching along with the rest of us. Professor, it's great to have you back on Bloomberg. I wonder if you thought either of these old white men helped themselves with black voters the way they comported themselves and tried to frame this issue last night. And if you can tell us what so-called black jobs are. Um, Twitter was asking that question last night, so I don't know what black jobs are. Um, I think former President Trump meant that 
uh, immigration was taking jobs away from black and brown people when he started talking about black and Hispanic jobs. But a lot of people in social media, particularly on X, formerly known as Twitter, uh, uh, took that phrase to be very, very offensive. Um, and so it underscored uh, the problems that Donald Trump has among black voters. So even where he is making marginal um, gains, perhaps in some of the polling, uh, it's really noisy, so it's really hard to tell. Uh, it's, it's actually, you know, I think the general action seem is still true. Uh, black voters who do turn out to vote are going to vote uh, probably overwhelmingly 80 percent and above for Joe Biden. That being said, Joe Biden didn't have a great night last night. That has to be um, admitted. And I think the big question coming out of this is not where his strongest supporters go, because they will continue to support him as long as he is the nominee. I think the question is, for people who have soft support or for people who are on the fence, did they see anything last night that gave them any confidence in either of these candidates to make them want to show up to vote? And so, you know, if the election were being held tomorrow, the mobilization effort would be very, very difficult. So we'll have to see how this rebounds in the next couple of months, because, uh, you know, I think people are, are looking at and expecting lower turnout than perhaps we've seen in some recent election cycles, and then wondering whose camp was going to be the least likely to turn out to vote, because that's going to be the side that loses. Well, and when we consider what will drive people, as you say, to turn out to vote, especially minority voters, is it going to be issue based and, and considering how little in terms of policy substance we were able to actually glean from this debate last night? Is anyone likely ha to have been convinced by any issue these two spoke about at all? Well, I mean, I think, you know, the biggest re uh, way that people turn out to vote is because other people ask them to turn out to vote. That's why campaign infrastructure and field operations are so important. Um, and we need to be paying attention to the number of campaign offices that both campaigns are setting up and the number of staff that they're hiring um, in states to get a sense of the type of outreach that's underway. And you need to count the number of phone calls, the number of doors that are knocked on, the number of mailers that are being sent out. That being said, in terms of issues and mobilization, um, while a lot of the discussion has focused on the optics of Joe Biden looking lost and stumbling over his words, there, were su there was substance there, not just in what was said, but also in what wasn't said. And so if people can kind of take away kind of the visual and actually listen to some of the discussion, they may have learned some things, not maybe as much as they would have wanted to, but they learned something. In particular, uh, uh, when candidates didn't answer questions, uh, when they pivoted, when they deflected, um, I think that they were uh, sort of betraying a certain lack of preparedness, but they might have also actually been portraying, uh, you know, the fact that they don't care about those particular issues. So if we, you know, look at uh, former President Trump's response to, uh, to, to thinking about climate change, to thinking about child care costs, uh, if you think about a charter to decipher what President Biden was trying to say about Medicare, I think that there are things that people can figure out about this, and they may actually be able to figure out uh, with whom they are closest in alignment with on some of these issues. Of course, you said he beat Medicare, uh, Professor, but I wonder if you can bring us to ground in Georgia. I want to speak locally about Atlanta and Georgia with you for a moment, because, of course, that was the location of this debate by way of CNN uh, being based there. And the spin room featured some familiar faces, including your governor, Kemp, who wouldn't even say that he voted, I guess, for Donald Trump in the primary, chose not to. Um, could Donald Trump win the state of Georgia? Where are Republicans with him now? Because it looked like an exception for some time. Um, so, yes, I think Donald Trump can win Georgia. Um, there are natural numerical advantages in the state. We don't register by political party in Georgia, but if we look at public opinion data, uh, if we look at the results of the 2022 election cycle, there's a lot of reason to believe that there are still numerically more Demo uh, Republicans than there are Democrats in the state of Georgia. Uh, now, that gap between Democrats and Republicans has narrowed considerably in the last 20 years. Um, and so what that means is that Democrats can win under certain conditions when Democrats are running flawless campaigns when they have a particularly compromised Republican candidate um, against which to run. Um, so, you know, if you want to talk about executing a perfect campaign, Joe Biden's performance didn't exude flawlessness, uh, but it really is going to come down to the field operations. It's really going to come down to events that are going to happen in the next four months before the election to really determine how uh, competitive Democrats are in the state of Georgia. Uh, and there are ways that Republicans could squander a victory in the state, but, you know, there is no reason to think that Republicans won't uh, be competitive in the state of Georgia in this election.
a state in which, of course, Donald Trump has been indicted, as have a litany of other defendants in a racketeering case related to 2020 election subversion in the state. He, of course, is also charged in a 2020 election subversion case here in Washington, in which two of those charges brought by Jack Smith relate to obstruction. And the Supreme Court today ruling at uh, earlier this morning, a January 6th uh, defendant may not be able to be a charged with obstruction in that way, calls into question complications around Donald Trump's case. We spoke with Elizabeth Weidra, president of the Constitutional Accountability Center, about this. And then I'd like to ask you about the impact after you take a listen. It's about the rule of law. It's about whether we have a system that um, can hold accountable people who have been obstructing um, not just justice, but obstructing one of the most sacred democratic aspects of our constitutional system, the peaceful transfer of power um, after the appropriate constitutionally held election. My question for you, Andra, is after this January 6th ruling today, as we await the court's decision on Donald Trump's immunity in this case on Monday, does any of it actually matter for the average American voter? You, I think that the immunity case is going to be more important. I, that has implications for the start date uh, for the January 6th trial in particular. And I think it also states a question about how, you know, absolute is the executive branch and, and, and executive power that I think is going to be really compelling and in the right hands could be messaged um, in a way to say something really important about Donald Trump's candidacy. This particular case could be viewed, you know, as a victory by those who are aligned with Donald Trump. Um, I'm not a legal expert, and I still need to read the case, but based on the news coverage that's happened so far, I think the larger question is, if the Supreme Court is saying that merely being disruptive outside of a political hearing is not obstruction of justice, uh, you know, is Donald Trump's role in, in, in this case, the alleged allegate, you know, the alleged charges in these case, in this case, is that the same as just, you know, standing outside of the Capitol and being disruptive and then being arrested for that? And so I think that there may be a way to make that kind of legal distinction that says that he doesn't necessarily benefit from this particular case in the way that some of the people who stormed the Capitol and who were subsequently charged and even convicted in some of these cases were actually implicated. Yeah, so we have to consider whether it benefits him legally, but politically as well. Andre Gillespie, political science professor at Emory University, thank you so much for joining us this evening. Now coming up, Biden and Trump did debate last night about the economy, tariffs, taxes in China, issues of substance. But as we know, it's Biden's acuity that took center stage. We'll be joined for more reaction by our political panel next on Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and Radio. crimes that you are still charged with. And think of all the civil penalties you have. How many billions of dollars do you owe in civil penalties for, for molesting a woman in public, for doing a whole range of things, of having sex with a porn star on the night while your wife was pregnant? I mean, what, what are you talking about? You, you have the morals of an alley cat. That was President Biden during the debate last night, weighing in on Donald Trump's criminal charges and morals. Joining us now for more reaction to the last 24 hours, Rick Davis, Republican strategist and partner at Stone Court Capital, along with Janae Wartell, Democratic strategist and partner at ARC Initiatives. Welcome to you both. Happy Friday to you. Happy postmortem of the debate day. Rick, of course, you've been involved in many presidential debates, many presidential campaigns. Biden's continues today. He was in Raleigh, North Carolina, vowing to stay in this race, win that state. But given what we have seen in the last 24 hours, is the race already effectively over? You know, I wouldn't call it over. Uh, I think that it's in almost insurmountable. I think uh, I think Joe Biden did a very good job today of trying to pivot and draw people's attention away from uh, the dumpster fire that was the debate last night. But the reality is, uh, I think he's got big questions inside his own caucus. Uh, he already had a majority of Democrats uh, worried that um, his age was a disqualifier. And uh, I would suspect that number's higher today. And so I don't think he's actually really addressed that issue. Uh, he's got an internal issue within the Democratic Party. And before he even gets to talking or having another conversation with swing voters, which are critically important to this election, 
the only thing that was good is, is this crazy debate was in the middle of the summer. <laughs> yeah. and, um, and he's got some time to potentially try to recover, but it may be unrecoverable. Uh, only time will tell. How does he do it, Janae? 48 million people, we understand, were watching last night. How does Joe Biden make up for performance number one? Well, it's no secret that President Biden's debate performance last night wasn't his strongest debate performance. Um, but I think what's important is that he got back up and moved on. Um, we saw that he delivered strong and forceful remarks um, in Raleigh, North Carolina, um, just this afternoon, a fired up crowd. Clearly, his support um, is still there um, amongst his voters and amongst the people in key battleground states that are going to be decisive in this election. And look, you know, the debate was one night, um, 90 minutes, in fact. Um, and you compare that against months that he's been on the campaign trail talking to voters in key battleground states. So I think the campaign and the president have to keep doing what they've been doing, going into communities, opening offices, hiring staff, and continuing to build a very strong ground game. And that's what's going to matter in November. Well, what we're also hearing from the campaign today is that they want to do it all again. Biden's campaign director, Michael Tyler, speaking to reporters earlier, said Biden is committed to appearing at that second debate on September 10th. Janae, can that help or hurt him more as we look ahead? Well, as I mentioned, when you don't have a strong performance, you don't go run and hide. Um, you take another you know, take another swing at bat. And so I think that President Biden will continue to be on the campaign trail in full force. We saw him in Raleigh today. We will continue to see him in key battleground states. And when he steps back on the debate stage, I believe that he will deliver a very strong performance. Look, he's the leader of the free world, the commander in chief, uh, as well as um, a candidate who is running for a second term as president. Um, that is, that's a lot on his plate. Um, so anyone could uh, appreciate and understand that um, as a leader, that he's got, um, he's got a lot to juggle. Um, but he certainly has shown um, in the months, in the weeks that he's been on the campaign trail that he can engage with those voters who are key um, and critical to this election. And what you saw on the debate stage last night is what you'll see on the next debate stage, which is talking about key issues, talking about the economy, talking about his plan for climate, talking about how he's going to continue fighting for and working for everyday Americans. And so um, I hope we don't lose uh, missed um, reviewing and critiquing the debate that there were there was a discussion of key issues that was on display and we saw that one candidate had a plan to move America forward and one candidate did not. Um, President Biden showed that he had the plan to move us forward and President uh, former President Trump um, continued to lie and to lob attacks um, and did not present a vision for America in the next four years. Rick Davis, you were on this program long before there was a deal for the first debate <laughs> as a former campaign manager saying you would never allow your candidate on a stage with Donald Trump. Seems like you might have been right. How about round two? Does this make it more likely that Biden debates to make up for what happened? It sounds like they're talking a big game or would you pull him back? Yeah, look, I don't think there was any good for Joe Biden in last night's debate. Forget the performance, right? Mm -hmm. I yeah. mean, he did not articulately express uh, the Democratic issues around inflation and abortion and climate or any of those things, right? There was no punch-through moment for him. In fact, the only thing that we played tonight was his personal attack on the legal cases that uh, Donald Trump had that he was convicted felon for, yeah. and it was kind of an unseemly attack. Um, so if I'm Joe Biden, I'm looking at going, okay, I scored zero on this, this scale. And by the way, I don't disagree with Janae about the, uh, the, the, the performance of Donald Trump. Overbearing, uh, inaccurate, uh, 30 different uh, misleading mm -hmm. comments or untruths. Um, but that being said, there was no correction of him doing that. The, the moderators didn't correct him. They didn't follow up on topics. Joe Biden didn't correct him. He didn't set the record straight. And so at some point, lies told many times in sequence become the truth. And that is the problem that the Democrats have with, with Donald Trump. Nobody is posting up the facts yeah. when he lays out the fakes. And so the bottom line is, if you can't fix that, why in the world do you give him another forum where another 50 million people can watch him tell lies? On the subject of lies and truth, that in part is what is contained in the statement from the president 
that Joe Biden served as Vice President Barack Obama put out a statement on X in defense of Biden, beginning with bad debate nights happen, trust me, I know, going on to say that the choice is between someone who tells the truth, knows right from wrong, or someone who lies through his teeth for his own benefit. My question, though, Rick, is if Barack Obama is standing behind his guy, does that effectively rule out the possibility that Biden is going to make the decision to not be the nominee come August? Yeah, I think that this is the, the advantage and the, the disadvantage of having uh, your old boss, <laughs> a former president, uh, still active in the political arena. Mm -hmm. uh, arguably, other than fundraising, you, there's not much evidence that Barack Obama has been able to uh, deliver votes for Joe Biden. If anything, the, the, the black coalition that was once so strong for Joe Biden is frayed badly. Uh, for Joe Biden. Uh, and so, sure, he's got my back is a nice theme. She stands by me. Joe Biden thinks she, he should still run. But the reality is he's got a rank and file problem. He can't get Democratic votes. He can't get the votes he got in 2020 from people who said he, they wanted to be president who are now saying they're selecting Donald Trump. So his problem isn't a leadership problem. His problem is a base problem. And at some point, there's going to be a conclusion that he can't win based on the campaign he's running because so far there's no evidence that he can. All right, coming up, we'll have more with our panel as the Supreme Court delivers a pivotal ruling backing a January 6th riot defendant. More with the panel on how this might reshape hundreds of prosecutions, not to mention the trial potentially facing Donald Trump. This is Balance of Power on Bloomberg TV and radio. Nancy Pelosi, if you just watched the news from two days ago, on tape to her daughter, who's a documentary filmmaker, they say. But she's saying, oh, no, it's my responsibility. I was responsible for this because I offered her 10,000 soldiers or National Guard and she turned them down. She said, I take full responsibility for January 6th. Donald Trump last night when asked about his involvement in January 6th, it was Nancy Pelosi's fault. Back with us, our political panel, Rick Davis, Republican strategist, partner at Stone Court Capital, Janae Wartell, Democratic strategist and partner at ARC Initiatives. Uh, Rick, are we in a world now where January 6th no longer matters with regard to this campaign? And I ask you that knowing that we are expecting an immunity ruling that could lead to a January 6th trial for Donald Trump on Monday by the Supreme Court. Yeah, I think that... Uh we have not yet seen the sun set on January 6th. I think it's still going to be a part of the Democratic campaign. Uh, there's plenty of footage to put into commercials. There's plenty to discuss. Uh, we all remember the, the Barack Obama speech at the Democratic convention talking about the balance of democracy. And at the time, nobody was really paying that much attention to this concept of democracy being at risk. Mm -hmm. And he put that right on the table. So sure, I anticipate that being a fundamental aspect of the Democratic campaign going forward, regardless of what the Supreme Court does on Monday. Mm. That being said, uh, legal scholars who you'll interview on Monday yeah. will tell you whether or not that has any efficacious impact on the trial itself. Mm -hmm. Whether or not that's actually a good campaign theme, I have questions about. Uh, I have not yet seen in the polling data a significant wedge issue into whether or not you believe Donald Trump is going to upset the democracy. Whether you believe it or not, the voters have not embraced that concept yet. Well, Janae, we also have to consider the court itself who heard this immunity question months ago and is literally extending the term into July in its wait to deliver an opinion, knowing the trial cannot go forward until they make this decision. Is it impossible to separate this court from the politics of the moment? Well, I think we've seen in recent decisions issued by this court um, that they are a very conservative court. I'm obviously most appointed by former President Trump. Um, and so, you know, in this moment, January 6th is not in our rearview mirror. And I think there is definitely a conflation of the politics um, of this court um, with the reality of how the justice system needs to work in this case. And so I think that we're challenged to really, um, you know, to really um, kind of separate the two and understand them objective. Uh, the objectivity of these two pieces. Um, but we need to let the justice system um, run its course and ensure that all who are involved are held accountable.
All right, Janae Wartell and Rick Davis, our political panel on this Friday, thank you so much for joining us. And again, on Monday, Joe, we are looking mm -hmm. forward to that opinion from the court. They actually have others to deliver as well on what will be the yeah. last day of the term, but the immunity question is the one that Truly looms the largest. drawing this out to the very end. This is going to hit right around 10 a.m. or a little after. Make sure you're with us on Bloomberg TV and radio for when that news breaks. And of course, you can get full coverage of it in the Washington edition newsletter as well. You can always find that on the terminal and online. Thanks for joining us as always on Balance of Power. Have a great weekend. We'll see you back here Monday on Bloomberg TV and radio.